I will now call the August 25th, 2020 special meeting of the board of supervisors to order. <clears throat> will the clerk please call the roll? Good morning. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Coonerty. Here. McPherson. Here. And Chair Caput. Here. Okay, uh, we'll have a moment of silence and prayer and a pledge of allegiance. And uh, you'll Chair, please join us. Uh, Chair, I hope we'll, we'll think about uh, the, the, the one life lost in the fire uh, so far as we've, um, um, as we take our moment of silence. Uh, we've been very fortunate that not have a lot of loss of life, but one life is too many. Okay, absolutely. Mr. Palacios, if you have any late additions or changes. Uh, there are no additions or changes to the agenda, Chair Kevin. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll go to uh, agenda item number four, consider resolution ratifying the proclamation of a local emergency for 2020 CZU lightning complex fires as proclaimed by the county administrative officer as director of emergency services on August 19th, 2020, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Resolution ratifying proclamation of local emergency. Uh, are there any questions from board members or comments? Well, well. His microphone's not on. Microphone's yeah, not on. Yeah, your mic. Been a while, I guess. Sorry about that. Excuse <laughs> me. Uh, yesterday, I um, toured some of our most uh, devastated areas with Supervisor Coonerty and our CAO, Carlos Palacios, and our fire, Cal Fire Chief, Ian Larkin, and others. And it's really indescribable in, in many ways. And I know some of our county team has lost their homes and so forth. As was mentioned, we've only had one life that has been lost to date that we know of, and that's one too many. But boy, the sheer power of the fire was uh, evident and everywhere we went. I, I have the, the utmost gratitude to the men and women of Cal Fire and the coordinated efforts that they're now uh, putting together with our fire districts who are battling these fires. Uh, Sheriff Hart, Jim Hart and his team who have, I think close to 80 deputies out there on patrol. Uh, California Highway Patrol, State Office of Emergency Services, uh, the California Guard, National Guard, and all the other cooperating agencies who are working to contain the fire and serve the needs of our residents. Um, I've been told, um, I think our County Council, Jason Heath, um, went to some of the distribution areas at uh, some of our places. He may want to comment. I might uh, ask him to please do so. It's just unbelievable what how many people are doing so much for 10 hour, 12 hour days uh, continuously. I do, I do think we had, um, we, I'm, we were fortunate to have a lot of pre-planning and disaster coordination. We have had disasters in the past in this county. And uh, what we've done in the recent years has been helpful to get us, uh, help us get a grip of what we're, what we're doing today. And I'm really proud of our county staff and the leadership of our CEO and his staff for their incredible work in providing services to our impacted community. They provide daily, twice daily, or a couple of day, times a day, sometimes three times a day, updated information. And this is one of the troubling things is that some people start spreading rumors or they're 
this is happening or this is not happening, please just go to an, uh, an authorized uh, uh, source of information, uh, such as we're gonna hear from uh, Chief Larkin here shortly about what is happening and what we're doing, because what we're doing is, is really, uh, really significant. And I, I just wanna thank the, uh, the members of our community, the faith organizations that have opened up their, their uh, organizations and local businesses and other groups who have provided food and shelter in some respect and sometimes to so many people. Um, and I just wanna, um, the biggest message I wanna send comes from Cal Fire Chiefs who have, have a lot of experience from other fires and we're in for a long haul here. Um, this is, uh, I think we're starting to get a grip on it. We're gonna hear about that in a minute. But this recovery is going to be a long process and one that we are committed to within this county. And I can just assure everybody we're gonna do everything we can to give them factual information and updated information. And I just wanna to thank to our state and federal partners uh, who are working to get us more resources. Uh, we'll, we need them more than ever. I think uh, we have at least a half a dozen helicopters now driving hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. We'll hear more about that. Uh, and that's a critical um, uh, um, activity that we need to do to fight this. But it, it just can't be overstated how much, and de how much dedication and professional effort has gone into uh, in so many avenues to help the people of this county under some really um, dire situation. So uh, I just wanna say thank you to so many people, but um, it was um, disheartening, but un unbelievable how the, the, the people wanna <coughs> stick together and help each other in this county. It's not surprising, but it sure is impressive. Just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Okay, Chair. Uh, maybe we should uh, have a presentation, Chair, uh, from the from uh, Carlos Palacios and the Chief. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Caput, members of the board, Carlos Palacios, County Administrative Officer. In my role as County Administrative Officer, I also serve as Director of Emergency Service Services. On August 19th, uh, I declared a local emergency proclamation due to the CZU August lightning complex fires, which began on August 15th. When a local emergency is proclaimed by the Director of Emergency Services, the county code requires that the Board of Supervisors ratify the proclamation uh, within seven days, and that's why we are here today. Uh, I have asked our uh, Chief, uh, Ian Larkin, to come and give an update to the Board and the public uh, on the status of the, of the fire. And so he will do that at the present time. And then after that, um, your board will take comments. Good morning, uh, Chair Cabot, members of the board, uh, uh, Mr. Palacios um, and members of the public. Uh, Ian Larkin, I'm the uh, CAL FIRE unit chief here for the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. And I'm also your uh, county fire chief for the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. Um, as uh, uh, Mr. Palacios said uh, on uh, in the late hours of uh, August 16th uh, and Sunday, August 17th. Um, the San Mateo Santa Cruz uh, unit in both counties experienced a significant uh, lightning event. Um, from that event, uh, we had 22 fires that were ignited by lightning uh, throughout both counties. Um, and if we can just scroll out on the map a little bit to get a much wider view. Um, what I can say is uh, as you look, you, if you can see the smaller red uh, dots that are outside the perimeter, um, those were additional lightning strike fires that were, uh, that were caused by the, um, that event that came through. Um, we were able to uh, contain those smaller fires um, due to their geographical location. They were much easier to locate. Um, the other fires uh, outside or within that perimeter you see now um, were in much more remote areas um, and had difficult access to get those. Um, yeah. There were two of you. One still. Excuse me, if you are on the Teams call, please mute your phones and computers. We can hear you talking. Um, so those remote areas, uh, it, was more, it was more difficult to get in and access those fires. So it uh, basically took the commitment of all of our CAL FIRE resources um, from our local unit, um, all 13 engines, um, our two bulldozers, and all available crews that we had, which was at the time uh, two inmate crews and one firefighter hand crew. Um, we had to staff those fires um, with minimum staffing, unfortunately, because of the number of fires in order to get them under control. 
Um, we also uh, work, reached out to our local cooperators within Santa Cruz County and San Mateo County um, to start a response as well and uh, augmented our CAL FIRE response. Um, fortunately, we were able to contain uh, most of the small fires in those, some of those geographical areas, but the larger fires in the remote areas, um, the resources just, they had to literally cut themselves into the, try to get into the fire and that took an, uh, an exhaustive amount of time uh, to try to get in there. Those, guy, those fires continued to grow over the next uh, couple days. Um, we immediately started asking for resources uh, and uh, to supplement and augment our initial attack responses. Um, we did receive uh, minimal uh, resources um, because at the same time throughout the state of California, uh, there was numerous other fires starting at the same time that were growing at a much rap rapid rate than uh, what we had here locally. So that drew down the uh, statewide mutual aid system, which is a very robust system here in the state of California. And we rely on that uh, uh, much of the time to help uh, suppress these large fires. Um, on August uh, 19th, 18th, I'm sorry, um, it, was, uh, it was very evident that we were uh, outpacing ourselves as far as uh, not getting the available resources we needed. Um, we had already asked for a uh, type three incident management team to come in and assist us with the, uh, the current fires and help us set up our uh, uh, plans organization and our logistical support for the fire, fire resources that we had at scene. Um, we had a lot of success at being able to maintain that status quo of about 250 to 300 firefighters but it was evident that it was gonna outpace us. So we requested a CAL FIRE incident management team come in and supplement our response and assist us in managing this larger event. During the process of getting that team here, um, we had a significant wind event that occurred. Uh, we had a uh, north northeast wind that came over the fire. Um, most of the fires were a backing fire. So they were in the ground fuels. Um, they were not in the canopy. Um, but that north northeast wind um, kicked up embers into the canopy and started a crown fire uh, in San Mateo County up in the uh, north part of Empire, or I'm sorry, um, China Grade uh, near the, um, the San Mateo County line um, on the what they call the old Hall Road near the Butino um, State Park. Uh, those embers um, basically cast um, a large ember cast um, over the fire area. Um, and, and spread spot fires um, six miles in front of the main fire. They were dropping embers into the Boulder Creek area. Um, at that point, um, we started to uh, make evacuation notices. Um, that night, that fire burnt um, an approximate 40,000 acres uh, in that one night. Um, the team came in and assumed command the next morning um, and uh, immediately started to implement uh, uh, new tactics and strategies based on our new fire perimeter. Uh, and we had already started augmenting those resources significantly that night during the uh, time that we, uh, we saw that this thing was expanding much, rap much more rapidly. We'd already had resources on order that just hadn't been here, but we just had to augment even more because we were knew we were gonna need more resources uh, to, to combat this fire. Um, so today um, we're at sitting currently at um, 78,600, I'm sorry, 78,869 acres. Um, it's 17% contained. That containment um, is uh, a direct result of the changing weather. Um, the one factor that creates a rapid fire rate and spread uh, here in our, our area and most areas uh, um, when you have these large complex fires uh, is the wind. So the wind has subsided, um, it's favorable. It's coming out of the west, southwest. Um, so, and it's at a much milder um, rate. So it's not uh, forcing the spread of the fire. It's actually pushing the fire back kind of on itself in some areas, which allowed us uh, to get in and get some containment lines in and uh, get a better control of that. So the 17% containment, um, along with the additional resources and the weather, um, we're get, making very, very good progress out there on the fire line. Um, we're able to um, put some indirect line in where we're putting line out in front of the fire. We're able to do some small firing operations in a controlled environment to uh, tie in those lines um, so that we're not in that very steep, treacherous terrain. This fire is burning um, in very, very steep drainages and things that are very dangerous to get uh, firefighters into. Um, the other impact that we're having, we're day 10 into this fire. Uh, yeah, I think it's day 10. and. Uh, these, the trees and the vegetation out there have been exposed to fire over these periods of time and it's starting to make it very uh, dangerous for the firefighters that are out in that area, let alone the members of the public that remained in the fire area and did not evacuate. Um, so those trees are coming down daily. Um, they are a constant threat 
Um, there is potential for some of those trees if they're burning um, near the fire's edge can fall and go across the fire line. So we're out there diligently trying to mitigate those hazards um, as we're trying to put in perimeter control. Um, we still continue to have 25,000 structures threatened. Um, we have confirmed through our damage inspection that we have 330 structures that have been destroyed. Uh, of those 330 structures, 319 of those structures are in Santa Cruz County. Currently to date, we have uh, 1,611 personnel assigned to the incident. And um, as Supervisor McPherson stated, uh, yesterday was a good day for us. We had some, uh, some lifting uh, of the smoke column and we were able to get helicopters in and make significant um, progress with our water dropping capabilities. Yesterday alone, we dropped over 200,000 gallons of water. Um, we timed out all of our aircraft that were assigned. Um, and when we say timeout, we flew them the maximum hours that they had available to them. Um, they're limited um, for the number of hours they can fly each day. They can fly seven hours of flight time. So we, um, we timed them out yesterday, uh, which, which is a good thing. Um, we still don't have any fixed wing. The fixed wing are a little more difficult because of the smoke column. The smoke hasn't lifted enough, but uh, our air tankers have not made any drops in the last day due to that smoke column. But we'll continue to fly those helicopters daily as we have uh, good air and uh, can get them in there to drop. Um, we currently still have uh, in, bo in both counties um, about 68,000 um, people evacuated. Um, that's a large number of people and the team is doing everything they can to uh, make the environment safe enough and make sure that we have good control lines in to make sure that we don't have any rapid spread of this fire before we uh, start releasing or um, uh, allowing people back into their home. So, um, it's a difficult situation to be in, but um, we're erring on the, caution, uh, the side of caution and safety of the public and having those pu members of the public out of those areas um, can uh, dr drastically help us in our effort to uh, make sure we have good containment lines in before we um, allow folks back in. Um, that's kind of the brief update. Um, I'll just kind of give you a brief overview of the map real quick. Um, the, uh, the real concerns uh, that they still have are the Highway 9 corridor which are on the eastern portion of the fire. Um, they're in there doing the containment line today. Uh, they did a few little um, firing operations yesterday just to tie in some lines, especially down in the Felton, um, Felton area of Fall Creek um, State Park. Um, so they're hopefully gonna have that operation all tied in today. The fire is currently backing down Felton Empire grade uh, road uh, towards the community of Felton, but there is, um, uh, a dozer line in there and containment line, and they're gonna build um, some additional depth on that line by doing a small firing operation to burn out that unburnt fuel between the main fire and the fire's edge. Um, the uh, Bonnie Dune area, um, we are making uh, good progress in the Bonnie Dune area. Um, they're still doing point to point uh, uh, structure protection and they've uh, got some good perimeter control in that area now, um, getting dozer lines uh, put in and uh, trying to go direct where they can. So. I'm hoping to see uh, some additional percentage of containment uh, in that Bonnie Dune area over the next few days. Um, we still uh, have a, um, uh, some folks that are still in Bonnie Dune um, that uh, we got word today that uh, a lot of them are uh, having difficulty in um, maintaining uh, water and, and feed for their livestock that they still have in place there. Uh, so I've been in contact with the team. The team has been in contact with the EOC. So we're gonna try to get them some uh, support out there um, and, and see if we can get maybe a fuel tender or something out there that uh, they can buy fuel from uh, to help uh, support their generator operations so that they can water uh, their uh, animals and, uh, and maybe get some feed to them uh, so that they can support that so we don't have a, a, a large loss of uh, livestock in that area. Um, the uh, last thing that I just wanted to touch on, I know there, uh, there's a lot of folks that are uh, feel that they're starved for information. Um, We've been very diligent in uh, our pursuit of getting information out there, but I just wanna give folks a few uh, uh, items uh, where they can get information. Um, they can just uh, search out if you have your in an app store to get the CZU uh, Twitter um, application and just follow CZU Twitter. We post all of our um, updates and any new information on the, uh, the uh, CZU Lightning Complex to that. We also um, uh, at our San Mateo Santa Cruz uh, Facebook page post that same information to that page as well. And then if you just, if you don't have any of the Facebook or any of the social media and you have a way to search uh, the internet, you can just search CZU Lightning Complex uh, and that will bring up all the um, factual data sheets uh, that are out there. 
Um, the other one, um, if people wanna see what evacuation zones are have been implemented, um, there is a link you can go to if you just uh, in your search engine or space bar, uh, you can just type in smco.community.zonehaven. Um, and that will take you to a link. It's smco.community.zonehaven. And that'll take you to a map that will actually show you all the zones. And we'll be using those, that same um, application um, when we start to do the repopulation once the uh, law enforcement and fire um, personnel from incident management team three have uh, determined that it's safe to uh, repopulate in the area. So um, with that, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Great. Uh Let's go to uh, Supervisor uh, Coonerty next uh, because uh, his area has been affected uh, quite. Uh, Chair, Matt, I suggest that if Sheriff Hart is on the call that we get a presentation from him as well before we go to uh, questions from before board members. Questions. Yeah. Yes, Sheriff Hart is, uh, is available and he's on the call and he can give an update um, as well. And then uh, perhaps then you can go to questions from board members. Good morning, board. CAO plus Jim Hart, Sheriff Kerner. And I just want to touch on the evacuation first. Uh, my office, along with a lot of local agencies and some mutual aid agencies, were able to evacuate about 50,000 people out of the San Lorenzo Valley uh, on, when this fire initially happened and then eventually Scotts Valley. And we were able to do that efficiently without clogging up the roadways. There was no injuries. There was no reported accidents. And we were able to get everybody safe. And that was uh, with a lot of coordination with CAL FIRE. Uh, we are working very closely with CAL FIRE. Uh, I have a lot of staff that are assigned to the command post. We are in constant communication with them. And we're really going off of their lead. If Chief Larkin or Chief C, who's in charge of Team 3, um, makes recommendations for for something that then we're, we're following those recommendations very closely. We have been blessed with a lot of mutual aid. And so how mutual aid works is you exhaust your office resources then your county resources and then we go into region two mutual aid. And we've we've reached deep into region two mutual aid. We're, they're providing about 40 law enforcement officers every 12 hours, in addition to the 35 or 40 deputy sheriffs and local police that we have. And we are closely monitoring what's going on in the evacuation zone. We have a lot of staff up there who are stopping cars and making sure that people uh, aren't preying on uh, the victims of this fire. We've gone from, we've transitioned from evacuation to now we're more of a security and a property protection team that's up there to make sure that people's possessions are safe. To date, we've made about 18 arrests for looting related charges or for people who are in the evacuation zone that don't belong there. We have 13 hard road closures occurring from the lower Scotts Valley, Pasa Tiempo area, all the way up to Boulder Creek and Davenport. And I, I really want to commend the California Highway Patrol. They brought in not only their own local staff, but they brought in staff from other regions uh, to help us with these road closures. There's two people per road closure. There's 13 road closures. So that's 26 people uh, a shift. 52 CHP officers a day are working on these road closures. And it's been a tremendous help and it's allowed our deputies and our police officers to be in the evacuation zone, uh, stopping people who don't belong there and making sure that property is safe. We're today and, and uh, yesterday we, we started working on a repopulation plan. So we're, we're developing that plan so that when Cal Fire gives us the okay to start repopulating certain areas, we're gonna have that plan in hand and we'll implement that as soon as possible. I know that people are, are, they're antsy. People want to get back to their homes. I get it, uh, but we're not going to allow that to happen until Cal Fire tells us it's safe. I know that personally I've been evacuated. Uh, I've had 74 staff members that have been evacuated. Supervisor McPherson has been evacuated. So we're all feeling this 
and, and it's hard. It's hard on families and it's hard to be away from our homes. And um, but the, the good news is, is that to date, we only have one confirmed loss of life. And as several of you have stated, one is too many. Uh, but compared to what this could have been, um, it, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, we do have seven missing person cases uh, pending. I think we've taken 28 so far and we've cleared 21. We've located and, and reunified them, those folks with family. But we do have seven cases that our, our investigators are following up on right now. And I, I just want to end with uh, I, I I'm sure the board is in the same position, but all day long I get emails and phone calls uh, with a lot of misinformation that's being passed. Yesterday there was a rumor going around Scotts Valley that that uh, that they were to repopulate immediately due to insurance reasons. And that was just bad information that was being passed around. And, and we can't have that. It takes a lot of resources to tamp that down. So uh, get get your information, please, for, to the community. Get your information from reliable sources. As Chief Larkin was explaining, we're posting right now information on our Twitter and on our Facebook and, and Cal Fire is doing similar. So please get your information from a credible, credible source. Uh, but I, you know, I know I've been here a long time. This is a, this is the biggest event that I've seen since the 89 earthquake. And uh, I know that Cal Fire is doing everything they can to contain this fire. Sheriff's office, local and regional police are doing everything we can to keep the community safe. And we look forward to repopulating and getting back to some semblance of normalcy, particularly in the areas that have not been impacted. And we all know it's going to be a long haul to get those impacted areas uh, back up and running. But that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. We have any other other questions? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to add my uh, deep appreciation to uh, to Cal Fire, to the Sheriff's Office, to all the cooperating agencies, and to county staff who is uh, mobilized quickly to help people in need um, with both in, a, in an effective way, but also in a really compassionate way. I've appreciated the values that have been demonstrated by the county staff as they um, as they try to help so many of our citizens uh, in this chaotic time where we're not only um, having to help people, but do it in the context of a, of a pandemic and an economic crisis at the same time. Uh, I wanted to check on uh, check with Chief Larkin about the status of uh, getting more support um, here, and uh, and then also um, patrols uh, or you know efforts to to put out the small flare up fires that um, that although we've got fire breaks. Um, may threaten uh, homes and and what's your what's the Cal Fire strategy uh, to protect people's homes uh, going forward? Uh, our our plan consists of uh, we still have resources heavily uh, uh, committed to the Bonnie Dune area and uh, those that are doing perimeter control and then we have resources that are doing point protect protection where they're uh, patrolling the areas, uh, finding hot spots and uh, extinguishing those hot spots in and around structures. Uh, to you know, mitigate that from uh, taking any more structures as far as destroying them. So uh, the strategy is to continue that as we get additional resources come in. Uh, yesterday, we had a very, very small number of resources come in. We're hoping that we have outstanding orders um, for additional resources. And, and just to put it in perspective, uh, if this was a, a time where we didn't have so many fires in the state um, and we would have had all the available resources to our, uh, to our request, uh, we would have probably had anywhere from 3,000 to 4,000 firefighters on this fire. Uh, to date, we're at just over 1,600. So we're uh, probably at half of what our normal staffing would be um, for a firefighter, uh, a fire of this size. So uh, that is hampering our efforts, um, but we continue to allocate those resources to those areas uh, with the, six, the most significant um, concerns. And we're doing a balance of that uh, resource level so that we can uh, uh, protect all the communities uh, that are affected. Great. Uh, thank you. And we'll continue to advocate in every way we can uh, to get you the support you need and the resources you need, understanding we're in a uh, difficult situation statewide. Um, can I, another question is, as the, as this evacuation continues, um, 
you know, I think we, we are all getting flooded with uh, requests for people who need to um, help animals that have been left behind or access medicine, uh, different, they need different things, uh, but uh, vital business records or other things. Um, is the, how, how, what do we say to folks as they're trying to um, uh, replacing generators that, that may have run through or, or refilling generators? Um, wh what's the response and how, um, how do people uh, figure out whether they, there's a possibility for them to get back up there? Yeah, uh, I, I'm sure Sheriff Hart will have a comment on this as well, but um, we've, we've evacuated those areas for a reason. Those that stayed behind um, made a personal choice. Um, we're gonna do what we can to try to help support that. Um, we've uh, been in discussions with the EOC about the possibility of getting a fuel tender up for those that um, are still there um, to help them with uh, potentially uh, giving them fuel to keep their generators going for uh, the preservation of uh, their livestock and things that they may have around the area. Um, those that uh, have not taken medication or they're running low on medication, um, they can reach out to their local doctors and local pharmacies and get an emergency uh, fill on their medication. So there are uh, resources available to them um, for those aspects. Um, as far as allowing people back into those areas, it's still just too dangerous to allow people to go back in for general needs such as business paperwork and things of that nature. Um, it's just it's just too dangerous. So we have trees coming down across roadways. Uh, it's it's even dan really dangerous for our firefighters that are in there trying to do perimeter control and protect structures. Um, just over the last couple of days, um, we've had trees come down ac across the road. I personally was driving uh, through the area and uh, within five minute turnaround coming back down the road, there was a large limb that had come down into the roadway. And I know the sheriff's department uh, reported they had a limb come down and strike one of their patrol cars while they were out doing the, uh, the protection of the community. So it's just too dangerous to allow people back into that area right now. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair, and uh, a remarkable amount of thank you and praise to both Sheriff Hart and his team and Chief Larkin and, and your team. Uh, I mean, realistically, none of us thought that in 2020 we would face another thing that individually taken would be take every resource the county has, but on top of everything else that we've been facing, it's, it's just unbelievable. Um, and I, I believe that Supervisor McPherson asked many of the questions actually that I had, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that that there, for those that are still wondering what to do and where to go next, there are still a lot of untapped resources. Not all the shelter spaces are full. Uh, both the county-led uh, facilities, the Red Cross partner facilities, uh, the local faith-based community facilities, there are intake people there to help you with benefits. There are people there working on SBA loans. There are a lot of options still that are currently not fully being utilized. I wanna be sure that the community knows that the partners of the county, uh, the state and the federal government, as well as the nonprofit and faith community have all come together to ensure that people have uh, everything that we can provide during this time. And to echo a point that Sheriff Hart made, it, it seems as though much of the day is spent uh, trying to correct misinformation that seems to find its way through social media. There are official sources. Uh, Jason Hoppen with the county has been putting out outstanding information through the county sites. Uh, as as Cal Fire and the team over at the Sheriff's Office. Every single supervisor has been putting out information that mirrors this information. Please get your information from official sources so that we can not address some of the fears that are being stoked through the misinformation. But uh, just a massive amount of praise to the leaders on this, uh, both in the fire and police response on this. It, it's just been amazing what you've been able to do with limited resources. And to uh, my colleagues on here, Supervisor, Coonerty, Leopold, and McPherson that are facing issues within your districts or, or soon anyway, uh, potentially. I just wanted you to know that the whole board stands with anything you also need uh, from a, a backup standpoint. Uh, we're here to help you as well. But thank you for your leadership and also Mr. Palacios. I, I can't say enough with the amount of information you've been providing us in your leadership during the emergency, but um, I, I hear from a lot of my constituents as, asking how they can help. They've been willing to be uh, plugged in to help. So I want the people that have been affected and displaced to know that there's resources available. Thank you, Chair. 
You're welcome. Uh, Sup Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Chief Larkin, uh, thank you for your presentation and for the work of you and your team. Uh, when faced with uh, something as catastrophic as this fire has been, the largest fire that we've seen in decades here in Santa Cruz County, and uh, recognizing that the resources aren't what we would want because of just the large number of fires, you and your team um, and, the, and the team that has been assembled has done incredible work. In fact, all the first responders have done amazing work. The same thing with Sheriff Hart and our Sheriff's Office, uh, who uh, both of you have been um, steady leaders during times of crisis, which is incredibly important. Uh, it's amazing all the first responders who have come not out of, not, o <clears throat> not only out of <clears throat> the, um, uh, the CAL FIRE and our local fire districts and, and fire agencies and volunteer fires, uh, but that other jurisdictions have sent uh, support both here from Santa Cruz County. I, I met when I was up at the, at the base camp the other day, folks from LA, folks from uh, other parts of the state. I know that we have folks from out of state that are helping uh, fight this fire. And uh, in talking with Sheriff Hart uh, and in his presentation, he mentioned the large number of uh, police that we are getting from other communities to help us during our time of need. And it's, it's really um, a credit to the, the strong mutual aid system that, that has been built. And it's why we uh, help out other people during their times of crisis as well. Um, I also wanna just uh, acknowledge the county staff that have really stepped up. Uh, we've been in uh, disaster mode since March. Uh, and the, the think that would be that before the start of this fire, we had 10 shelters with 600 people. And now we have countless number of shelters for almost 2000 people. And that all happened within a week um, is, a, is a real credit uh, to just the commitment that county staff have uh, to make resources available to people during a time of crisis. And I especially want to just acknowledge the CAO's office. Um, our CAO, uh, Elisa Benson, Nicole Coburn, David Brown, Sven Stafford, Jason Hoppin, they've done incredible work uh, to get these resources out to people. Um, I also want to acknowledge Michael Beaton, uh, the EOC staff, and all the volunteers who have been helping there to help coordinate all the different aspects of this. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in order to make that happen. Um, it's also been incredible to just see the the number of people who wanted to volunteer and to help out. Um, and that happens uh, at the shelters that have been stood up uh, and all the different ways that people have opened their homes, have, have made resources available to people in need who have contributed to GoFundMe, um, who are volunteering at, at uh, Emmeline to accept donations. Uh, the, what I hear is that, you know, you have a bunch of young people who are out there really stepping up. When we hear about young people being apathetic and not being involved, what this year has shown me is that that's quite the opposite, is that we have an engaged and involved uh, uh, younger generation and that now they've also stood up uh, and helped out uh, their neighbors, their friends, their parents, uh, um, the community as a whole. I've also been impressed by the, the number of people who've wanted to give money. Uh, and it's great to have a partner in the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County. Uh, people have, have contributed an extraordinary amount of money so far uh, to help out people in the time they need. Um, yesterday, uh, uh, most of us were part of a briefing uh, that was held um, in Scotts Valley at the base camp. Uh, and you and your staff gave a great presentation. The sheriff gave a great presentation. And we also heard from the leader of Cal OES. Uh, we had the CHP commissioner there. We had the National Guard leadership there. We had uh, FEMA representatives uh, just coordinating those forces to be able to be there to help out people during their time of need. Uh, it, was, it was great to see that there uh, and the commitment that everybody had made to help make that happen. I will also want to commend you, uh, Chief, and the Sheriff's Office and the team 
for the daily briefings. You know, that's most of us now wake up in time to make sure that we can get our 6 a.m. briefing. Um, we make sure that we end the day with our 6 p.m. briefing, uh, but through uh, Twitter, Facebook, all the different ways in which you and your staff are providing accurate information so people can understand what's really going on in this fire and don't have to depend on what they heard on next door or you know what they, they think must be happening because they smell smoke. Um, it's really important and it's, these are powerful tools that we now have. And uh, sometimes we complain about uh, social media and its impact on society, but in this case, it's been very useful in spreading accurate information. And I just wanna appreciate your staff. And so to all the people who've responded so far in this commu community, we are all grateful uh, for that. And to all the people who've been impacted by this, I just want you to know that this board, the county stands with you and we're gonna do everything we can to support uh, our community during uh, this time of crisis. Thank you for your work, and uh, I look forward to us voting on this uh, resolution. Mr. Yeah. Chair? I want to thank uh, uh, everything you guys are doing out there. It's very dangerous work, and uh, you're putting your lives on the line, and we, we really appreciate it. And, you know, God bless you uh, for all the work you're doing. Um, I know in South County, uh, the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds is becoming a uh, it is a shelter and it's got uh, over a thousand people there. Uh, tents all, all over the place and uh, people inside the larger buildings. And uh, it's uh, just amazing to see everything come together. <coughs> the Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, they're, you know, helping out. Uh, and it's also a place for local ranchers and farmers to bring their livestock, their animals uh, over there to the fairgrounds. Uh, there's uh, horses everywhere <clears throat> and uh, cattle and pigs, uh, chickens, rabbits. Uh, we even have turtles out there uh, when I was out there. And uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we have no uh, maybe idea how much livestock has been lost. Uh, and what is the other measures maybe on uh, people that, you know, I guess uh, in, a, in a fast moving fire like this one that really had no playbook, uh, <clears throat> some people would just have to let their animals go and let them run off and try to get off on their own. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we don't have any specific numbers on the loss of livestock or animals at this point. Um, I know uh, as they're out doing damage inspection, um, they're, they're documenting some of that. Um, um, a lot of people were able to get their uh, small animals and things out, um, but the, the livestock, um, uh, most of the ranchers uh, were well in advance of this, uh, were able to get their animals moved to a safe location. Uh, and some of them are all still trying to get their animals out of the area uh, as we speak. So um, we don't have any specific numbers on the loss of, uh, of that type of, um, you know, statistic uh, on, on the fire. So um, I hope that answers that question. Yeah. I, I did want to point out a couple of things that uh, Supervisor Leopold uh, uh, brought up. Um, uh, for folks that are out there that um, may have uh, needs, uh, there's some additional resources that are available. They can go to disasterassistance.gov. That's a disasterassistance.gov um, to that web page, and there's resources available to you. You can also download the FEMA app. Um, or you can, and from your either a Google Play Store or your Apple Store, um, or you can call FEMA at 1-800-621-3362, and that's 1-800-621-3362, or it's just spelled out FEMA. So um, those are some resources that you can get to right away, or you can also reach out to the uh, Small Business Administration for some of those business owners um, to try to get um, uh, some assistance moving forward. The other thing I wanted to point out, our damage inspection numbers, um, the data is being given to each of the counties, uh, and those, the county is going to be disseminating that information here readily um, once they've uh, uh, validated the, the information and have it in a format that the public can use uh, as far as a searchable website for addresses for damaged uh, or destroyed structures. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, 
uh, here over here, Supervisor McPherson. There's one question I forgot to ask this, this morning's briefing, um, and that's the green waste pickup. Uh, some people are concerned about spoiled food uh, and so forth. And uh, are are they able to operate in some of the the areas, or uh, what, what's the status of that? I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to go back and ask that question. Um, <clears throat> I know in Scotts Valley where I reside, um, I've been evacuated uh, and there was a, um, a green waste truck going through on normal delivery days. So it sounded like they maybe have let them through in certain areas, but uh, in the highway nine corridor, those areas that are directly impacted, um, and it may have just been an anomaly that they got through the uh, checkpoint, but I'll go back and check and we'll make sure that that gets um, put out uh, in the press release. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, quickly, I want to thank the community for all the help uh, that they're doing. People br uh, bringing down all kinds of uh, either uh, food or uh, blankets or uh, brand new clothing and everything. Uh, the churches are all uh, organizing in South County and they're helping out. Uh, and also the Lakeview Middle School uh, is a staging area, it's a shelter area, and Watsonville High School uh, will uh, also be open uh, for overflow. Uh, and, I, and then uh, with all the good stuff we're you know, complimenting, there's always a few people that take advantage of this situation. Uh, my understanding is uh, hotels and motels, a few of them are taking advantage of this situation by charging double or triple uh, their normal uh, uh, prices. Uh, have you seen that at all? Um, I, I haven't seen it personally, but I've uh, heard of it um, that some people are paying um, well over the, uh, the the rate that would normally be charged, uh, sometimes in excess of um, three to four hundred dollars a night. Right. Um, so I, I know um, that is being addressed and uh, being brought back for um, appropriate action. Chair, chair uh, yeah. pe people who uh, um, are experiencing that should contact the district attorney's office yeah. um, to have them investigate. Yeah, they, uh, they will look into it. Uh, district Attorney Jeff Rozelle said definitely they'll, they'll look into all of that and hopefully uh, find them or something like that. Okay, uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to, well, yeah, we'll open it up to the uh, public hearing and uh, good to see you. Hi, Gary. Uh, chairman, supervisors, we're calling for a grand jury investigation. I think uh, you know why, by putting uh, more uh, responsibility on the county administrative officer who has been cunning and deliberately deceitful, uh, that has been involved in uh, with the Community Foundation, Susan True and Margaret LaPaz, who's the vice president of Permanente. Uh, that's a huge uh, medical organization that has a conflict of in interest. Uh, it's, she is being paid by a secret donor. This lack of transparency that you have accepted is outrageous and unacceptable. And the very fact it was good to see Mr. Hart on there and Mr. Leopold giving him praise because Mr. Hart has not taken uh, responsibility to investigate Zach Friend, who's got a couple of red Chinese uh, communist friends, uh, just like Mr. McPherson's received tens of thousands of dollars from the red Chinese. This is a Wuhan flu, by the way, from China. Um, and those people from the Grange, their personal being were in jeopardy and so was their property according to those phone calls and the people that received them. And what would might have happened to those properties was burning down. Now also Margaret Lopez just happens to be uh, belong to another organization that is interested in land trust. Isn't that interesting because these fires and so forth are making it available again for these so-called land trust uh, that go into big private organizations like your Panettas and like your you know, all the rest of these people that are driving uh, the state of California. These places will be made available uh, to uh, the land trust once again. And you yourselves abolish the planning appeals board where people could put up structures, create fire breaks and do things for themselves. So part of this responsibility lays on you once again. Um, 
again, the uh, uh, people that are involved in this uh, include a pedophile network because everybody you see is involved. Uh, the material I gave you last time showed pictures of Willie Brown and Governor Brown with uh, Jim Jones, the man that gave the Kool-Aid to those children. You find today that Governor Newsom recently appointed to the chancellery, a man by the name of Drake, both his wife and himself are members of the Wexler Foundation who financed Jeffrey Epstein. You can find Leon Panetta's right-hand man when he was chief of staff for Clinton was Tony Podesta. People out here know more than you're admitting to and the lying Sentinel newspapers, which Bill Gates got a cabal. He bought the Mercury, the Sentinel, the Herald, and the San uh, Luis Tribune and turned them over to globalists. That's why the people don't know what's going on. Don't let that man be in charge of any emergencies. Your CAO is deceitful and evil. Don't put him in charge. Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Caput. Yes. I just wanted to, to remind you and remind folks that the public comment period associated with this special meeting is directly related to the briefing that you just received on the fires. We're not doing um, COVID related public comment or public comment on anything else within the board's jurisdiction at this point in time, that would be appropriate for the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Thanks. Morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Um, this I think has to do with the fire, which I spoke about last Tuesday that I witnessed hundreds of strikes of lightning that were horizontal. It was very unusual. I think it's wonderful that the community is coming together in all the ways that it is to help each other. It'd be great to see that with everyone and more personal self-reliance. So I'm gonna quote a couple things because I feel I need to. Um, the first weather modification patent was in 1909. It happened due with ships and smokes. But what's going on now is not normal. You know, during the Vietnam War, they discovered that they could seed the clouds and create monsoon storms that would take out bridges much more effectively than bombs. Um, there's a great deal of research that's out, if anybody wants to do it, that these storms are not natural. My understanding is that there's over 300 fires in California alone. People will take a step back and look at what's going on in history, what was going on nine months ago in Australia with all those fires. There's an incredible amount of information that those were deliberately set. So here we have a government and I'm standing before my local government and I see you guys doing the best that you can, but it seems like the citizens need to educate you on what's really going on. You know, during this storm a week ago in the Midwest, deliberately 40% of the grain silos that are storing food for the world were destroyed during these storms. There are these storms going all over the world. And somebody's got to say it, this is deliberate, deliberate. So I don't know if I have any solutions and I certainly am not getting paid to be here. And I don't think I'm really putting myself in a position of safety to be speaking out. Now I could be way more direct than, I'm just not going to be specifically direct. So um, I'd really like to work on what's really being looked into and I may, I took some notes and stuff. And uh, one thing that I'm gonna stand behind and, and work on, and I will be as lawful as I can as a sovereign human being is during the son of the shrub presidency. And that was during the early 2000s. And I'm talking about the Bush junior presidency after these wildfires, clear cutting was set forth. And you look at, at the cascade fires and the paradise fires, that's exactly what's going on right now. Now they're, you know, Fires are natural, fires can heal. You know, if you look in these forests and I did some driving around a week ago cause I was able to and I negotiated going through the law enforcement, <clears throat> saw a lot more dead trees than I had ever seen before. And these ones that weren't, they weren't actually on fire. They were just dead already. So anyway, I appreciate that we can all still speak here and hopefully we can be as kind to each other as possible and be in a state of love cause that's all that's really important. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Next person. Yeah, if uh, when one speaker is done, if the next person can be there 
also in line. Go, please come forward. Yeah. Hi, thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm Wendy Sigmund. I'm from Boulder Creek. And I want to say I appreciate the firefighters and Cal Fire and the sheriff, what they're doing to protect our property now and what they've done um, <coughs> so far. I am with, I don't even know how many thousands that are displaced here in Santa Cruz. And I am asking you, my government, my leaders to to give us some sort of plan. We know it's going to be a very long time before we get back there. Myself and my family were staying in a motel, which is not feasible because it's extremely expensive. We were, we stood in line yesterday to get vouchers for hotels, but they're sending us, or they're separating the family. They're sending some to Malpitas that we got so far. They're offering San Francisco and we work here. So that's not really feasible either. Um, we appreciate the food that was there, but it was, it was snacks. It was, it was nice, but um, I it, and I appreciate it. I want you to know, I do appreciate everything that everyone is doing. Um, but I look to our leaders to say, do we have a plan that can happen quickly? Because we are not gonna be able to stay the way we are for very long. We're in crisis mode. Um, I had one proposal of maybe as a, on, a, on a county level, we can talk about uh, suspending the occupancy tax for our hotel rooms or something like that. Um, if there's a way we can negotiate lower rates for just the city's hotel rates, we're asking the, the visitors not to come here, which I know hurts our economy, but we need to fill those rooms. If we have these empty rooms, can we fill them with residents that need them at a decent rate. Um, I guess I'm not looking for a, a direct solution now, but I'm hoping that you will get us some help quickly. I also, in my live that I was just doing, got a question of, I'm sorry, we, um, we know it's gonna be a long time, but if we had some time frame, is it a month or is it six months so that we can make plans for this next six months or one month of, again, we can't stay in a motel for that long, so is if we had a better time frame, at least, at least you know, a month, six months, a, a better picture of what that's gonna look like. And again, thank you. Thank you all firefighters. Thank you, sheriffs, firewood patrol, the board, everyone that is working really hard to um, protect us and, and keep, get us ready to rebuild. Thank you. Thank you, next. Hi, Marilyn. <coughs> Yeah. Good morning. I'm, I'm an evacuee. And um, thanks to the fire department, I, my life's work might be saved, but I would, I wanted to talk about something else. I didn't know it was just about the fire, but I would like to say this. Gentleman before me mentioned, for example, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, whether you believe in weather uh, control or not, it did happen in the Vietnam War. They, they uh, seeded the clouds in, uh, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and it rained like crazy. I, my question is simply this, and it perhaps is a rhetorical question, but if, if you can control the weather in Vietnam, why don't they seed the clouds and make rain? It might, uh, it's something I, I've never heard anybody mention, but uh, perhaps it might work. Thank you. Mayor Lunke, uh, thanks to the courageous firefighters, of course, and uh, the points made by the two previous speakers about whether modification and geoengineering has been done going on for a long time, causes of fires that are not well publicized. I'd like to list a few because it's a certainly extraordinary. I've quoted Barry Trower. He gave a talk called The Truth About 5G and Wi-Fi. And there was a section there where he's talking about trees and how the immune system of the trees is damaged we can destroy by the wireless uh, microwave frequencies from 4G, 5G, et cetera. 
And in this talk, he had a document from Australia where they're putting in uh, 5G that from the telecommunications industry that said the trees need to be removed to have 5G. They need to be out of the way. Um, so th there's the condition of, of our earth and what is weakening and destroying ecosystems is a very serious question. And I have a picture here of a fire from a cell tower catching on fire. So these smart meter cell tires catch cause fires, and I'll leave that with you. And um, the lightning described very, very abnormal, what James was talking about. Uh, and the fact uh, people have seen pictures of where the fire was, Boulder Creek, et cetera, and it's in a grid, a grid. That's, that's not normal. This is the same time when uh, hundreds of satellites are being launched into the ionosphere of setting the natural electric circus, circuit of the earth. Uh, how much is the launching of satellites related? It's a question I have. Regarding the county administrative officer, uh, personally, I don't have uh, confidence because I've seen in attending these meetings a priority put on the well being of corporations and moneyed interests and not respecting the public and women. And I think uh, Rosemary, who's the director of emergency services, uh, was doing a good job, I heard. And why isn't she included in your closed session meeting coming up? That's a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marilyn. <clears throat> Hi there, Monica McGuire uh, from Coralitos. Thankfully, uh, Chief Larkin, lovely to see you again. Thank you for your incredible work. I have been very, very careful with everyone I know, the hundreds of people I know living up in the mountains and Mr. McPherson as well. My, my heart goes to everyone and may we all continue to rain love down on our fellow community members who need support and care. Um, I'm so sorry that you're going through what you are. It's just really so difficult. And we really are, it's amazing being out at the fairgrounds volunteering and seeing people all over the county. There is a feeling of, of great joy at the way that people are treating each other and coming together. It's, it's just awesome to see that as ever. Um, there have been though, amongst the many conversations we've heard several questions that really don't make much sense as Mr. Um, as James brought up, James Ewing Whitman, that he asked last week about the fires and brought up the lightning strikes, but we didn't hear anything from any of you. If, if this fire was going on already, assuming you were being informed, uh, it, it doesn't, we don't quite understand why there wasn't more warning a week ago when we were all together. Um, and, and please consider that, that that kind of warning that there were, the lightning strikes had hit ground um, and that there was, I as well saw this VIIRS uh, satellite image with a grid of tiny fires in the Boulder Creek Mountains area, et cetera. It was very strange looking and I would love to understand what that is and what's going on. But then another very official thing that's very, concerning is three different people I know talked about being out on Highway 1 and seeing as many as 10 Caltrans uh, trucks sitting by while fires, small fires were going on around them saying that they were supposed to close the highway but they were watching the fire get worse in ways that a shovel just issued to each one could have made a huge difference that while waiting to hear something official they were supposed to do for Caltrans could also help prevent the spread of this incredibly dangerous 
uh, existence of fire as we know in the middle of summer. So there are so many pieces that we hope that you're doing in your closed sessions that we would love to hear about from you to understand more what you can do to assist people to talk about out at the fairgrounds, they had more meals, real meals than uh, that were going to the pigs because they were going bad. So I, whatever that is, I would like to just say some of those meals, maybe you can coordinate better that they go to the other shelters because it was really tragic to watch. I mean, of course the pigs need to eat, to eat, need to eat too, but there was pork in some of them and that felt terrible. So we, we just asking that you understand little ways that we are all, as usual volunteering to assist. We will do all we can. There's also a video um, of a, hydration and um, and fire protection available on Craig Lane's YouTube. So if that can help anyone, please let that help. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> anyone else uh, here? If, if we could have you kind of line up so we don't, yeah. Good morning. Um, so. I'm really puzzled about this fire thing because I was here a week ago and there was zero mention even made that there were fires in our county that were threatening any homes at that point. And so how did we let this get out of control to the to this extent that it did? It's unbelievable to me. There were people on next door saying, and I smelled and saw uh, smoke myself. I would go on next door, see what's going on. And the official word, um, forget the woman who did it, but she's an official person in some capacity and with fire in this county, said, oh, there's nothing to worry about. There are some fires on the borders of the counties and the, um, the wind is blowing it all the way down to the ocean. And then we wake up the next day and it's Armageddon. What happened? How, how did we let it get so out of control? And we knew these fires were happening already. So this really concerns me. Um, that's really all I have to say, but I, I'm very curious as to how we let something get so out of control. And we know that these woods have not burned in decades and they're just full of fuel. So thank you for all the work that everyone is doing. Um, obviously, I think there must have been some sort of breakdown in communication or a breakdown in the way that resources were being uh, handled, but we need to do better in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anybody uh, down in the room downstairs? There's nobody. There's nobody There's in, no the one in the community room. There's nobody in the community room. However, we do have one web comment. And this comment is from Becky Steinbrenner. Do, dear supervisors, why are we also not thank, I'm sorry, why are we not also thanking or even mentioning County Emergency Administrator Rosemary Anderson? Why is she not part of the closed session group that is meeting after this pro proclamation is ratified? Please also give praise to the hundreds of equine evacuation volunteers that continue to work to help rescue livestock and pets. Why is law enforcement now prohibiting them from crossing fire police lines to help people? Where can people in the shelters get their mail? Many are wondering and no one at the shelter seemed to know. It would be very helpful to have a large screen TV at all shelters so that those people could watch news sessions like this one and others at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., right? Right now, all shelter evacuees have are maps with no one to help interpret the information or answer questions. We could use technology to help people get this important information. People who have stayed behind to protect their homes in the fire areas report they are not seeing, that they are seeing no CAL FIRE units in their areas. Where are the CAL FIRE units? Please give these people the fuel they need. Do not sell it to, to them. As Chief Larkin reported, it will happen. Please announce any new rules and regulations that come from the closed session that the CAO can now institute, including conscripting all county employees as well as members of the public. Sincerely, Becky Steinbrenner. And that's the end of public comment. Uh, yeah. Chair. Uh, anybody else here that would like to speak? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board uh, for questions. I would maybe in uh, this situation, if we could have uh, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty make the motion 
and the second because uh, your areas are more affected than everybody's. So it's up to you though. Okay, uh, Supervisor Leopold. Any uh, questions? Or? Thank you, uh, Mr. Palacio. Do you want to make any comments about the uh, resolution itself? Okay, fine. Okay, I would move the resolution for uh, ratifying existence of a local emergency. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Any other discussion or questions? Okay, we'll bring it up for a vote. I'll do roll call. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Caput? Aye, passes unanimously. That concludes uh, public comment and, uh, and the motion. And we'll now go to closed session. Uh, is there anything to uh, report from closed session? No. No, okay. So thank you very much uh, everybody for being here and take care. I hope everything's going okay where, where you live and all that. God bless you, thank you.